I'm going to invite up onto stage um, Tim. Where are you? There, there you are. Uh, Tim Richards. Um, do give him a round of applause. Tim, thank you. Um, let me just give a brief word of introduction to Tim. So, so I've only really just met Tim today, um, and I've already been fascinated to hear his story, which we're going to unpack for you in an interview format today. And you'll find out that Tim is a, a local pastor now, but that he took a break from being a pastor for the best part of 20 years, and uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, hear that story now. So if you would take a seat, Tim, and we'll, um, we'll hear your story. Uh, so, Tim Richards, um, you are pastor of a local church. you want to tell us what, what that is, where, where you're a pastor at the moment? So I'm uh, currently the lead pastor at Dungeness Community Church, about five miles out of town, and have been there for the past three years. Fantastic. Um, you've got a really interesting story, though. You more or less grew up, as I understand it, in a Christian environment, mm -hmm. um, but you went through a significant period of doubt. Now, that's the very short version of this. Take us back to how things started out for you, your initial kind of startup in ministry and so on, and, and yeah. what led you to this very intense period of searching and doubt? Yeah. Well, as you said, I grew up in um, a home that was filled with faith, a very strong Christian background. And I think from a very young age, uh, I had an interest in church and ministry, that sort of thing. Uh, after I finished high school, I went to a Christian college and was preparing for ministry. Got out of college, got married, uh, went on to seminary, did my graduate school there. And at the end of graduate school, then I received a call to go to a church in Central California up in the Sierras and as an associate pastor. And it was just a wonderful experience. We loved it, loved the church, loved ministry. It was... Uh, just a great thing. But my problem began uh, in the course of some counseling that I was doing, um, a situation that I ran into, uh, a number of situations, but one in particular with a person who had been through just some um, very traumatic, abusive stuff in their childhood. The problem was that the nature of it made it hard to determine sometimes what was true and what wasn't true. And I'm a guy that likes closure. And so, being caught in this situation where people are in such deep pain and yet not knowing what was true, not knowing sometimes how to bring my faith to bear on it. Uh, this one night, I'm awake, I'm thinking about all this stuff, and suddenly this thought goes through of, well, what if none of it's true? I mean, none of it. God, Jesus, any of that stuff isn't true. And I thought, well, that's ridiculous. I know better. I've got my graduate degree. I, I know all these answers. Um, but I couldn't I couldn't get away from that nagging thing. And, and that actually, over the next two years, uh, pretty well owned me. Um, and this was while you were in ministry? While I was in ministry. You were, you were heading up a reasonably large church at this point. Right, which presents a little bit of a problem if you're a pastor and you're doubting God. Um, uh, I, I've said that during that period, I never said anything that I didn't believe, but sometimes it had taken me all week to get there to where I could say it. Right. Um, finally hit a point um, where I just realized that one of the tensions for me was the question in the back of my mind was, do you, are you trying to hold on to what you believe because your paycheck is tied to it mm -hmm. or because it's what you really believe? Mm. And I finally concluded the only way I could really answer that fairly for myself was if I detached my paycheck from it, which meant resigning from my position. Wow. And um, that was a pretty scary step. I didn't know where I was going to do, what I was going to do next. Uh, we did own a home in California. Everybody knows that if you sell a home in California, you make a lot of money, unless you happen to sell during the one downturn in the California housing market, which we managed to time perfectly. <laughs> and uh, so we moved to Squim with a house that we couldn't sell. Um, I didn't have a job. I didn't have any plans. I did have a wife and three children. Uh, so we ended up living in this little cabin on the back of my in-law's property, 750 square feet with uh, cold water and a toilet you carried out three times a week. And um, I saw a photo of it today, and it looks a bit like that, that movie, The Shack. Uh, that's, that's, have that in your mind. That's, that's kind of the yes, same thing. Yes, yeah. Shack is actually a generous term for it. <laughs> and um, uh, so we were there for two years. And I said if I had a banner I could have carried with me for those two years, it would have been a failure. Mm. Uh, I felt like I'd failed my family. I'd failed my church. I, every, on every front, I felt like I had failed. But... A big part of that journey was to say, okay, God, there's no pay paycheck attached now. Are you really there or aren't you? Mm. Okay, so take us through how you started to put the pieces of the puzzle back together again. Yeah. 
Uh, if you ever heard me talk about this issue, I always talk about what I call the faith puzzle. And uh, I, I think about it because when you get to a jigsaw puzzle, it just looks like a mess. It's like there's nothing there. It makes no sense at all. But anyone who's done a jigsaw puzzle knows that the first thing you do with a puzzle is you start looking for corners. Because if you can find the corners, you've got some anchor points to begin building the rest of the puzzle. And, and for me, the anchor points in the puzzle that, that I felt would help me figure out what is the picture and is God part of it. Um, science was a big part of that, really a starting point for me. Is there any evidence for a God of any sort, if we think from a scientific point of view? Uh, history was another corner piece for me, particularly as it related to the New Testament, as it related to the claims of Jesus. Because if there is no credible witness for Jesus, and if he didn't rise from the dead, well, then I can at least take Christianity off the board if I don't know anything else. Um, philosophy was a big part of that as well. Uh, just thinking through the whole issue, and the biggest issue I think you deal with in faith is the problem of evil. Mm. And, uh, and when you get to things like philosophy and the problem of evil, one of the things I began to think about was, well, there's also this problem of good. Because the very fact that we think there's a problem with evil means that we have some sense that there is such a thing as good that allows us to think something is evil. And if we're just the result of a mindless universe, where do we get the concept of either one of those things, good or evil? Uh, when it came to history and, and the case for the New Testament, I won't go into all the stuff, but if any of the books that Lee Strobel has written are, are really good entry points for thinking about this. He's written a book called The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith. Um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, I'd recommend any of those as a good starting point. Um, and then the fourth piece for this was experience. Um, it's one thing to have a, a philosophical scientific, historical framework to say, yeah, I think that there's a reason to believe there's some kind of intelligence. I think there's a reason to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. But, but really, it doesn't matter a whole lot if you've just got a theoretical construct, if there isn't any opportunity for a personal connection with that God, mm. Mm. whoever, whatever it is. And so that's, that's where we get into the whole you know, experience miracles, this of course, becomes a big part of that. Yeah. Um, so you, you had your four corner pieces, let's say, of mm -hmm. the jigsaw, these anchor points. Um, so just run us through them again. History, science, philosophy, and experience, experience. was it? And, and so in a sense, did you find in that two-year sort of searching period that you were finding enough to sort of begin to re-anchor aspects of your faith? Yeah. You know, beginning with science for me, that, that seemed like the really neutral ground to start from. Um, there's no religious bias when you're talking about science. Well, I'll say that with quotes <laughs> because there certainly can be a bias. But um, what, what are the things, what are the evidences for intelligence behind the world? And I think that one of the reasons we struggle sometimes in thinking about these issues is uh, there, there is a guiding principle in science called methodological naturalism which says that if you're going to create a theory about the way the world works, uh, you need to develop that theory based on natural processes that we have access to, that you can replicate in a laboratory and show mm -hmm. over and over again. And, uh, and that's fine. Uh, it's been defined. I'll throw up this. Oh, that, if you want my full story, there you go. The faith puzzle, there's a shameless plug. <laughs> um, Stephen Meyer has said that Methodological naturalism is that a theory must explain all phenomena by reference to purely material, non-intelligent causes. And, and I would say that that is um, basically a good, a good rule of thumb. Where it crosses a line is into something that, uh, but I think, Justin, you've talked about this medical, physical, uh, metaphysical um, naturalism, naturalism yeah, yeah. where it becomes the philosophy of life, and it says mm. that not just do I look for natural causes to the events I see around me, but I've concluded that material is all that there is. Mm. And, and, and I've actually drawn the rules before I've even done the investigation to say there can't be anything beyond the rules. And for me, there are a few things that cause me some problems with that. Um, one of those, at a very foundational level, is if you're going to say matter is all that there is, we believe that our universe sprang into being in this big bang, and you have to say, well, what was before that? How do you get something from nothing? And, and I think we have a hard time really picturing nothing. You know, when, when I say nothing, I mean 
nothing. And, and there's not even air in the nothing. There's nothing. And, and there isn't anything to disturb nothing. There's no agitation in nothing. There is nothing. No thing. No thing. And if there is no thing, and it's perfectly at rest being no thing, how does everything come out of that? You know, so you end up with this problem where then you're saying, well, either there had to be something that was always there mm -hmm. or someone that was always there. And if you're saying something, then you're saying that everything is a result of an eternal, non-intelligent piece of matter. But how does that generate intelligence in everything that we know? Mm -hmm. And now you're making a statement of faith to say, I believe there's uncaused matter which pure methodological naturalism says, well, you can't say that because everything has a cause. So I just see that creating a huge problem. Uh, the other thing that stuck out to me are the signs of intelligence that we run into all around us. And we know when we see signs of intelligence. Here is something I found in my yard uh, a couple weeks ago. I was walking out to the car, I looked over in the grass, and I happened to see a little pile of rocks. Well, that's weird, why are there rocks in my yard? Now I could explain there are rocks near my yard, but why this little cluster of rocks in my yard? And I got looking at it, and there's two branches, both of them pointing away from each other, both of them a forked branch, and it all just looked kind of arranged. And it caught my eye. I kept looking at it, and then I realized that I knew where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> there was a reason why there was that arrangement of seemingly random objects out there, and it's because there had been an intelligent cause behind it. Somebody had built a snowman. <laughs> now, if I did the same thing, but I found this laying in my yard, I would be even more intrigued because this looks really arranged. I mean, there's like a pattern to this. And whenever I see a really strong pattern, I begin to ask myself, well, does that pattern tell me something? Or who made that pattern? What's the cause of it? And if I found that pattern looking something like this, I go, you know, that has meaning to it. That has significance, and if I was a radio operator, I would recognize that was Morse code, and it would lead me to something that I think shows just as much intelligence. That stands for three letters, DNA. Hmm. Bill Gates said that DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. And I just look at that, and I have a hard time reconciling that kind of organization and information and intelligence as coming from nothing or coming from non-intelligent matter. Coming from a completely unguided exactly. process. So, so this was obviously a key, as you say, corner of the puzzle yeah. for you, which seemed to prefer an explanation that went beyond the naturalistic one that, yeah. that you were obviously wrestling with at that point. So take us through those other three as well. How, how did we start to put the puzzle together on those fronts? Yeah, so uh, you know, looking at the the textual history, the evidence for the resurrection. Again, I, I'm not going to do too deep into that just because I think Lee Strobel and others develop a lot more in depth. But what I saw was that if you read the New Testament with any degree of fairness, like we would any other ancient document, there are strong clues, strong evidence in there that what these men said they saw and what they experienced, they did experience. And, and it's hard to come up with a good, plausible reason for it. There's a lot of fanciful reasons out there, but things that really struck me as being making good sense other than the resurrection. So that was a significant one for me. As I've said, the problem of pain, uh, also then the problem of good. That was a biggie for me. Um, you see people wrestling with this kind of stuff. Even people feel pretty settled in their disbelief in God. Um, you know, when I talk about things like science, um, I've been intrigued with people like uh, Richard Dawkins, who is, is known for his atheism, and yet when he looks at life and all of these issues, he's actually thought that, well, maybe we were planted here by aliens. Go, oh, well, okay, that's, that's a pretty creative solution. You know, other people come up with the multiverse, maybe we're just one of a lot of, you know, this universe-generating machine, but no one answers where did the universe-generating machine come from. Um, so the problems are real, and when you look at the philosophy, the history, that kind of stuff, that, that stuff strikes me as very real and plausible as well. Once you're willing to say, I think there is a God, there is an intelligence, then I think you're ready to take the next step and say, has he revealed himself in history? And 
in a sense, you had put your life on hold up to this point, kind of to, to give yourself the time and space to investigate this. You didn't want to just be someone who believed it kind of because the Bible tells me so or just right. because someone else told me. You, you, you had this sense that you had to investigate this. Was, was there a point at which you felt, okay, I've got enough of the pieces of the puzzle in place now that I can start to give myself permission to believe in that sense, to have faith again? I think that was one of my challenges, was you can be a skeptic for so long that you block yourself from coming to a conclusion that would imply faith. Skepticism is an easy way to try and protect yourself from looking stupid. You know, as long as I treat everything else as stupid, then I look smart. That doesn't mean everything else is stupid. And it, but it leaves me in this sort of nowhere place of I don't believe anything. Mm. Well, I think there is something to believe, and at some point you have to come to a conclusion and move forward. Um, C.S. Lewis, he's got a quote. I'll see if I can jump to it here. He says, to see through all things is the same as not to see. Mm. That's what I find skepticism does sometimes. You find the person that forever is picking apart and seeing through everything, and eventually there isn't anything. And yet we know there, there is something. And, and so for me, all of these pieces were coming together. But I think then you do come to this issue of experience. And, and does God invade our lives in any way that's meaningful? And that was... That was the, the final piece, as it were, that needed to come into position. Um, because we're talking about miracles in yeah. today's event. That can obviously there's a whole range of phenomena which might come under that umbrella term. Um, and, and many people talk about the mir miracles of the everyday thing. Not many people can say that, you know, this particular, you know, I was raised from the dead, though we've got someone here who does claim that. Yeah. Um, what, what for you might, in your story, constituted that kind of personal experience, that kind of sense that maybe God is trying to reach me in some way? beyond just these, if you like, intellectual aspects of the faith. Yeah, you know, it, it would be uh, a simpler story for me if it was just, uh, you know, Dr. George's story, I was dead and then I came back. <laughs> that, that's pretty clear cut, although that's incredibly fascinating. Um, You'll get but, the full story later yeah, on that uh, one. Mine wanders a bit more, but it was, it was very meaningful. Mm. And I'll try to give the really short form. In, in the midst of my angst, and this before I actually left the ministry, um, a friend of mine put me in touch with a guy who um, just had a very deep prayer life, and, and he felt that God often spoke to this guy, revealed things to him, you know, prophetic words, if you will, which, frankly, I was incredibly skeptical of, and there's a whole story behind that. But I also was at a point of saying, well, if there is any kind of a God, and if he's got anything to say, this would be a great time for you to show up and say something. And so... I. My wife and I, Burnett, we, we met with this guy. I, was, I wouldn't even tell my church where I was going. We just went away for a weekend. It's like, they're going to think I'm a, a madman. But we, um, we met with this guy. He starts praying with us. And um, he, in, he begins to share with my wife that he felt that, that God was going to uh, bless us with another child. And you I'm, had three already at this we point. We had three already, and we weren't looking for another one. Okay. Um, and I admit, my first response is, well, uh, A, that's not going to happen, and B, you're going to drive my wife into the funny farm because she was totally stressed out with three kids. We don't need four. But I figure, you know, this is probably your stock prophetic word for young, fertile females, you know. So that, this is where my mind is at. This is how much faith I have, right? And, um, and there were some other things he shared with her. He said, you should be collecting your boxes because you're going to be moving soon. I'm thinking, well... You probably forget we're in crisis. A lot of people move when they're having a problem. That's where I meet with you. So, okay, lucky guess number two. But sorry, dude, we're not moving. That's not reason for being here. And what do you mean collect my boxes? So I kind of push all that aside. And he starts talking to me. And he says, uh, I really feel God's called you to ministry. Thinking, well, you know, I'm Mike's friend. You know, I got short hair. You probably guessed I'm a pastor. <laughs> um, and... But how he said, but God may not always keep you in ministry. He uh, is going to bless you in some areas of ministry, but that's to free you for ministry. I'm thinking, whatever that means, because I had no intention at that point of leaving the ministry. I was fully committed. And okay. um, Anyway, some other things he shared with me that were intriguing, but I pretty much was not buying any of it. Mm -hmm. and, and we left. And my wife on the way home, she says, what do you think of that? And I said, I don't know what I think of that. I... There's nothing there I plan to try and make happen, and I don't know if any of it's true. And that's where we left it. 
about three months later, uh, my life really hit a wall. Um, I ended up taking a sabbatical, and uh, by the time we finished the sabbatical, I knew that I needed to step away from my pastorate. Mm -hmm. So I'm leaving the ministry. And I think about this guy's words, mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, coincidence. And uh, we come home, uh, we get back to where we lived in Sonora, and we're literally getting out of the car. I've got one foot on the floor, on the ground, one foot in the car, and the neighbor walks over. Hey, guys, welcome home. How you doing? No one knows that I've come back to resign. She says, um, do you guys need boxes? <laughs> well, and that's a weird conversation to have. <laughs> and, um, of course, I'm thinking about what this guy said about collect your boxes. That's kind of strange. Oh, he said, because you're not, in, when he's talking to Burnett, he said, because you're not going to have room for all your stuff where you're going, whatever that is about. So we're going, well, yeah, we could use some boxes. Her husband had done a big remodel job. These folks had bought all new boxes while they'd moved out. They'd just moved back in, folded the boxes up, and gave them this whole stack of brand new U-Haul boxes. So there's our boxes. So we get moved back to Squim. And as I told you, we end up in this little tiny cabin. All of our stuff goes into storage for two years. And that's kind of interesting. Here I am, out of ministry, trying to get a business started, all my stuff in storage with my boxes. But I'm not buying it. I, I just... I just couldn't let myself go there. And I'm working through all this other stuff, and this is all kind of mounting up. And finally, this one day, um, I, I'm waiting. Oh, I get up, and the phone rings, and it's uh, DSHS. Okay, we're flat broke at this point. I figure, I know what Burnett's done. She's gone and got food stamps. She doesn't want to tell me. And I said, hey, honey, here's the phone for you. She says, oh, you have to go outside. <laughs> Really? Well, when you live in a tiny cabin, if you want privacy, you have to go outside. So I went outside, and she talked, and I came back a little while later, and she met me outside in the orchard, and, and I said, so what was that all about? Did you get food stamps? She goes, no. And she says, I have something I need to tell you. I think we know what's coming. Okay, guys, we know how babies are made, okay? And we were trying really hard not to have one. I don't leave it at that. <laughs> I just, I just began to weep because for me, I realized you could say, oh, well, you could chalk it to the chalk to that. But for me, it was like all these pieces came to point. It's like, okay, Tim, either you can keep on saying, no, 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 I doubt, I doubt, I doubt. Or at some point you say, there's enough evidence here with all four of the pieces and this experience I'm having to say, God, I think you're there. And I think you've known where I was going to be. And I think you're active in this. And, and I trust you. Mm. And uh, that was... I can't say that was the end of the journey for me, but that was a significant turning point. Right. And I'm assuming now you have absolutely no doubts whatsoever and everything is peachy. That's why I love the, the, the metaphor of a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> because when you do a jigsaw puzzle, you, you keep fitting more and more pieces together and the picture keeps shaping up more and more. And, and you get to a place where you say, I think I know what this picture is. This makes sense to me. I know what I'm looking for and, and I'm enjoying this picture, but especially in a big puzzle, until the very end, you've always got a pile in the middle that you don't know exactly where they go. And to me, faith is like that. There, there is still, for me, a handful of pieces that I go, I'm not sure exactly where this goes. Uh, maybe I'll never find out until I see God face to face someday. But, but that's okay, because the rest of the picture is there to where mm -hmm. I go, I feel confident in working on this picture, that I put my faith in the right place. It's a really interesting analogy. Now, you, you sort of, I know that you did a whole series um, on the faith puzzle, if you like, uh, a, a few years back, and you use this analogy of the corners of the puzzle and starting to put it together. And the fact that very often we don't have all of the pieces, but we're working on the big picture, and, and that the big picture is the thing we, we strive towards, which I love as, a, as an analogy for faith. Um, I know, though, um, that there was a specific moment, it's another really interesting story in your journey, where you, you came into contact with a particular piece of that puzzle in a kind yeah. of unique way. Do you want to just quickly tell us about that? Yeah. So when I did uh, this series that's on the faith puzzle, uh, about a month before I did the series, my mom passed away very suddenly. She was 80 years old. Um, and so on top of getting ready for this series and running a business, I'm trying to take care of cleaning up all of my mom's affairs, which meant you know doing the big estate sale and cleaning the house out and all of that. And uh, one night, I was there by myself at her house doing some cleaning, and I was going through this closet, and I found this little toy puzzle. It was a wood puzzle. And uh, you know how you just have these moments? It was like at my mom's house. She's gone. It's cleaning out. And I just sort of have this sort of memory of playing with this puzzle as a kid. And so I just sit down and put the puzzle together. And I get the puzzle all put together, except there is a missing piece. 
And I searched the whole closet. I, go, I cannot find the piece. And uh, it was kind of interesting because I'm doing this whole puzzle talk, you know. And, and, but I think, well, that's, that's too bad. Never could find the piece. Well, after the sale, we clean all this stuff up. And there is tons of stuff to, you know, has to end up going to the landfill. I rent the biggest trailer I can get. I pile this thing high with all this stuff that has to be thrown away. I, I take it to the landfill, and I'm, I'm unloading the trailer. And I've been thinking about some of this stuff on the way in. And anyway, I'm unloading the trailer, throwing stuff out, and just tons and tons of papers, and you name it. I get all the way done, I'm sweeping the trailer out. Sweeping the trailer out, and something green catches my eye. It's the one piece I was missing to the puzzle. How I had never seen it in all the searching, the loading, everything else, but it was, it was like one more little thing that God just said, Tim, I am that piece. You know, I, I am what you're looking for. And um, it was a, a meaningful moment for me, you know, on a miracle scale, maybe tiny, tiny miracle, <laughs> but, but very meaningful. Um, you'd been at this point on a break from ministry and started a business and, you know, for the best part of 20 years, as I say, you were kind of out of the ministry thing. Um, but eventually, not long after the, you presented on the faith puzzle, you actually found yourself being drawn back into, into church ministry. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the last part that guy had shared was that God was going to take me back into ministry someday. And over those years, I kept saying, well, when's that going to happen? How's it going to happen if I'm not sending out resumes? That's not your best way to find a job. <laughs> and, and yeah, you really didn't feel clear to do that. And my wife, who has a great gift of faith, kept saying, just, just wait, be patient. I, you know, I'd say, well, what's the difference be, between being patient versus being passive? You know, there's a fine line there. Um, but we're just kind of waiting, and uh, I'm doing the faith puzzle, and suddenly the church we've been at for 20 years, uh, Scott Culver, who is a senior pastor, decided that he was going to retire. And I thought that was interesting. I could maybe help do some speaking while they're finding the new guy. And uh, then they came and asked if I would be the new guy. And which, quite frankly, initially, I was pretty much like, no, that's not going to happen. But then as I started thinking about it and talking about it, it's like, well, we have thought, we have prayed, we have talked about this for years. Um, if, if this isn't God opening an opportunity, if I say no, I will spend the rest of my life probably thinking, okay, God, you placed it before me and I walked away. And it's been a been a wonderful experience. Okay, wow. Um, I guess that I, whenever I do my radio show, Unbelievable, I'm always thinking, now what, what does the skeptic, what does the atheist think of this? And that those are the questions that I often am trying to pose myself as we're having conversations. Um, and I suppose the one thing that I can hear a lot of people saying at this point is, okay, cute story about the puzzle. Um, great that your life kind of came together again in that way. But, you know, coincidences happen. Mm -hmm. um, so where do you, I mean, how do you come down to the point where you can say, okay, I'm moving from simply saying coincidences happen. We shouldn't really trust that, you know, there is some kind of overarching purpose to all of this, to the place where you can say, actually, I'm going to move into that different way of seeing life, that, that picture that I'm actually going to say, this is what I'm working towards, this is what I'm trusting in. How does the move happen from one to the other? You know, I think what it is that moves each person, I think, is pretty unique to the person. As I said, one of the, the traps that I, I think I got myself into was just being a skeptic for the sake of being a skeptic. You can always say, yeah, but. I, I don't care what point anyone makes about anything, you can always say, yeah, but. Just look at any court case. You know, the, the most obvious criminals in the world get a defense attorney that if you listen to him, they'll paint a, a picture that makes you go, wow, maybe he really didn't do it. You know, the smoking gun in his hand was kind of just a fluke. <laughs> um, so, so at some point, you, you for, your, for your own self, have to say, well, I've, I've honestly looked at the, the evidence. And I think part of an honest look at the evidence is you have to say, have I drawn boundaries that are artificial? You know, like what we can do with science sometimes, where we say, well, my definition of science means there can't be a God. Well, that's an artificial boundary. You know, I, I, as, as a boss, I have a policy manual for my staff. And, uh, and policy manuals say, here's how you're supposed to do stuff. And, and, and I would say that's kind of uh, methodological naturalism. It's the policy manual. Here's how we do scientific theories. That's great, and that's what you should stick to. Unless 
as the boss, I show up and I say, I'd like to do something different right here. To me, that's what miracles are kind of like. It's like, well, here's the, here's the way things normally go, but I can't draw, you know, if I show up to my staff and say, I want to do something different, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, Tim, you're not allowed to do that because we have the policy manual. I'm like, ah, guys, I wrote the policy manual. If I want to make an exception here, I think I can do that. It's okay. Um, so I'd say part of that is saying don't, don't draw an artificial boundary that keeps you from taking an honest look at the evidence. Mm. And, and then at some point, I think everyone has to decide for ourselves, do I see enough evidence there? Has my experience drawn me to saying, I think there is a God, and if there is, how does my life intersect with that? What does he have to do with me? And mm. I believe the claims of Jesus are the most credible, powerful evidence of how, as a human being, I connect with God. Can we give a round of applause to Tim? Thank you. Tim, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so if, uh, if people want to look at your story again, um, thefaithpuzzle.org, yeah. is where's, it? It's somewhere. Where's the shameless plug? <laughs> we'll go back to the beginning. Um, but that's got videos, it's got your story, and uh, there we go, thefaithpuzzle.org for, for more if you want to find out more. But Tim, thank you very much for framing some of the issues that we're going to be opening up in the, in the conference today, and thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.